Thanks for tuning in with us at Dream City Church Omaha. For further information, including past sermons, visit us online at dreamcityomaha.church. We hope you enjoy the message and that it has a positive impact on your life. Here. Today we're going to continue our, our series entitled Mo Money, Mo Problems. And uh, we've been talking about money, finances, how do, we, how do we be good stewards. Three weeks ago, we started the series and we talked about how, how, first of all, it's not a money issue, but it's a heart issue. How that Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, that our treasure leads and our heart follows. And if our heart is, is taking us in a direction we don't want to go, because the Bible says to guard your heart above all else, because it determines the course of your life. The direction your life is going is based upon what's in your heart. And Jesus said that wherever our treasure is, that's where our heart is going to go. So if, if the direction in the course of our life is on a path that we don't like, then we have to reallocate where we're investing our treasures. Where are, we, where are we putting the things that we value? Are we investing here in earthly things or in heavenly things? And so we talked about how it's, it's really, it's a heart issue. And then the next week we talked about the tithe. And what is the tithe? Why do we tithe? And how that tithe simply means a tenth. A tithe is a tenth, and, and we are told in scriptures to bring the first fruits, bring the tithe into the storehouse. That's the first 10% of our increase, because we understand that everything that we have is not ours. That we are simply managers. We are stewards of what God has given us. And so that first 10%, we are bringing back to him because it's his anyway. And he says that if we would give that in faith, if we would honor him with the first fruits, that this is the only place in the Bible, he says, to test him. He says, test me in this. Try me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you won't even be able to contain. And so as we give that in faith, that first 10%, as we bring that back to him, he says, I will bless the rest. That you, we have the ability to bring blessing or cursing based upon what we do with the tithe. And then last week we talked about being a good steward and how that a steward is a manager of somebody else's affairs or, or estate. That we, the, the, the house that we have is not our house. The car that we drive is not our car. Our bank account, our money is not our money. Everything that we have is God's. It's just the estate that he's entrusted to us. It's, it's, we are the ones that are managing it for him. And so last week we said, well, how do we, how do we manage well? How do we, steward, how do we steward well? We said, well, first we have to get good advice. That we have to get solid advice because in the multitude of counsel, there is wisdom. And then we, we said we have to plan, 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 and then, and then plan some more. We talked about how we have to save before we spend, and then we have to be faithful in all things. And the question we asked last week is, what does God want us to do with his stuff? Because it's not our stuff. It's not our resources. They're his resources that he's entrusted to us, and how does he want us to handle that? Today, we're going to continue, and we're going to be talking about how do I be content? How do I live a life of contentment, because I think this is, this is something that really, if, if, if we were all honest, we could all stand to grow in this area. Okay, I just want to make sure you guys are still awake today. This is an area that we can all grow. To, to be content simply means to be satisfied with what one has. Are we satisfied with what we have? Are we content as we as we live our lives. And so we're going to look at, at God's word and see what, see what Paul has to say in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And, and in verse 7, this is what he says in his, his letter to Timothy. He says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. How many of you guys, if that's all you had, you would be content with that? Don't answer. You don't have to, like, honestly. Like, it's easy to, to sit in here and clap and be like, yeah, that's right, that's me, Pastor John. But if all you had was a pair of clothes and a McDouble from McDonald's yesterday, would you be content with that? It's not a question that we can answer lightly. It's not a question that we can just off the cuff say, yeah, that's me. It's something that we really have to search our heart and ask about. We will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and into a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Okay, I don't want that to be me. For the love of money, and this is a verse that's often misquoted in saying that the love of money, or it says that money is the root of all evil, but, but really money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money 
is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then the author of, of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content. There's that word again. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Let's pray for our time together this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that over the next few moments, Lord, that Holy Spirit, would you come and have your way? Would you say what you would want to say so that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish in our hearts and and in our lives? Lord, may this not be about what I can do, but only about what you can do, because I can accomplish nothing, but you can accomplish anything and everything. And like John said, I must decrease so that he can increase. God, that is my prayer today, that in my weakness, may your strength be made perfect. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear what you are speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 Paul writes to Timothy, he says, look, when, when you were born into this world, you didn't come with anything. And when you leave, you're, you're not going to go with anything. You can't take anything with you. I heard this story about this, this man, and he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you've only got a few days left to live, and, and I would advise you to get your estate in order, get your planning ready, invite your family and friends, say goodbye to who you need to say goodbye to. So the man went home, and, and he talked to his wife and said, here's what I want. I, I want to take everything with me when I go. And his wife kind of looked at him and says, what do you mean? And he says, well, I want to take all of the money. I, I want to go to the bank, take all the money out, put it in two duffel bags. What I want you to do is I want to take those duffel bags and put them in the attic so that when I die, I can grab them on my way. And so his wife kind of, you know, she's like, whatever you want, baby, like if that's what you want me to do and if that's, if that's your wish, then that's what I'm going to do. So they went down the bank, took all the money out, put them in duffel bags, put them up in the attic. The, the, the day came and, and his wife went to check on him and he had, he had passed. So she called the family and she called the friends together and everybody's there at the house consoling her and and offering their condolences and, and it's like this light bulb went off she's like the money I wonder if he got the money so she goes running upstairs and and looks in the attic right where she had left it were two duffel bags full of money and she came carrying the bags down the stairs and she had told the family about the arrangement and the family says was it there was it there and she said yeah it was still there she says I knew I should have put it in the basement Yeah, get it? <laughs> get it? That was like a Pastor Doby story. Like, that was, I feel like, you know, I'm 34 years old. I'm getting a little bit older. I feel like I can start telling some of those, some of those real cheesy stories. But Paul writes and he says, look, we, we, can't, we can't take anything with us. And yet, as, as I look at the state of, of our society, as I look at the state of my own heart, my own life, It feels like we are accumulating so much stuff as if we think we can take it with us, right? What we we have so much, we have so much stuff that we can't even fill our houses with it anymore, and we have to start putting it in the garage. And some of you are like feeling really convicted right now because you can't even park your car in your garage because it's full of stuff. And some of us are feeling even more convicted because not only can we not fit our cars in our garage, but we've had to rent storage units. No, like I'm, I'm serious because as I drive around town, it's crazy how any of the big open buildings that you see around town, what are they turning those into? Storage units. They wouldn't be buying up every property and turning it into storage unit if there wasn't a need for storage units. And why do we need storage units? Because we don't have enough room to keep the stuff that we own. And we're accumulating and we're, we're, we're getting and we're getting and we're getting as if we can take it with us one day. Pastor Doby says we're, we're spending money that we don't have on things that we don't need to impress people we don't even like. And it's true. And, and as really, as, as Americans, this, this discontentment, this unsatisfied heart and and mindset that we live with is dangerous because if we let ourselves continue down this path of discontentment, discontentment leads to unhappiness and unhappiness leads to anxiety and anxiety leads to stress and stress manifests itself in our physical bodies. They've done studies in the last 30 years, the 
the rate of happiness as, as Americans are responding to this survey. Are you very happy? Are you happy? Are you moderately happy? Are you unhappy? Are you very unhappy? The way that we are responding as a nation has continued to go down over the past 30 years while the, the, the number of us who are reporting daily aches and daily pains is continuing to go up. Our stress life levels are rising. Our anxiety is rising and our happiness is going down. Why? I think it's because we're discontent and we're unsatisfied with what we have. As Americans, we have $784 billion of credit card debt. $784 billion. The average, the average American carries $38,000 worth of debt, and that's not including a mortgage. $38,000. They did a study in, in 2017. They did a study of, I think it was 3,000 people who had passed away last year. And of the 3,000 people who had passed away last year, 73% of them died with debt. At least $10,000 worth of debt. And it's something that we have to, to address. And it's not a money issue, it's a heart issue. It's a discontentment issue. And the reason why we're spending and we're spending and we're acquiring and acquiring is because we're not satisfied with what we have. We're not content with what we have. We're like Mr. Wilson in Home Improvement. Always putting his face up over the fence and looking into our neighbor's backyard. And what would he say? Heidi ho, neighbor. One of you remembers. He'd look over the fence. Heidi ho, neighbor, what's going on? And, and he's looking into his neighbor's yard, into their life, seeing what's going on. See, we might not go into our backyards and look into our neighbor's life, but do you know how we are, Mr. Wilson, today? It's right here. We get on Facebook and we look into our neighbor's lives and we get on Instagram and we see what's going on in our neighbor's life. And we compare that to what we know about ourselves and it leads us to this place of discontentment because my life doesn't appear to be as good as theirs. I don't appear to have what they have. And they look happy and they have. And so if they have and they're happy and I want to be happy, I have to have too. And that's the trap and it's the the, the mouth wheel that we find ourselves in. I was talking to somebody this week and they said, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s and, and as I look around, everybody my age is, is happily married and their kids are doing great and they've got these great jobs and, and I'm just here like, what's going on? What's wrong with me? And, and I told him, I said, look, nothing's wrong with you. I said, the problem in what's happening is you're comparing yourself to them on Facebook. How do you know your friends are happy? Well, because they post this and they, they're over here and they're doing this. I said, you can't do that because Stephen Furtick, he, he preached a message one time. He said, when you do that, you're comparing your cutting room floor to somebody else's highlight reel. Like all they're showing you is their highlights. They're not live streaming that fight between them and their spouse yesterday. Right? Like when you get into an argument, uh, not call them a fight, we'll call them arguments. If you get into an argument with your spouse, you're not like, hey, hold on, let me live stream this. Because I want all my Facebook friends to see this. If your kid's acting up at Walmart, you're not, let me get out my, my phone because this needs to go on Instagram because you are so adorable right now. Like nobody is showing you those areas and those sides of their life. All they're showing you is what they want to see. And meanwhile, you're sitting there and you know your struggles and you know your hurt and you know your pain and you know where you're at comparing your cutting room floor to somebody else's highlight reel. No wonder why so many of us walk around feeling discontent. Because I can never live up to your highlight reel. And you can never live up to mine. That's why Paul says, don't compare yourselves one to another. See, we, we have to get to this point where, even as Paul says, look, well, even if I have just, just food and clothing, I'll be content in that. I'll be good with that. I'll be, I'll be satisfied with that. So how do we as believers, how do we as, as Christians, how do we live this life of contentment. What are the things that we need to do? If you're taking notes, this is the first thing I want you to write down. And if you're not taking notes, you should be taking notes. The first thing is this, count your blessings. How do I get to this place of living with contentment? How do I get to this place living satisfied? I, I have to count my blessings. I don't know a lot of times this phrase gets kind of thrown around a lot, but this week I really, I truly want you to take some time and sit down and get a pen and paper or get the, the, the notes app out on your phone and start writing down all of the ways that God has blessed you. Because each and every one of us 
regardless of our socioeconomic standing, regardless of our station in life, regardless of how we find ourselves as we come in here today, all of us, if we sat down to think about all the ways that God had blessed us, we, we, we really could continue writing that list for the rest of the day. For, for, for days, for, for weeks at a time, because everything that we have, the breath in my lungs is a gift from him. The ability to, to, to even get out of bed this morning is, is a gift from him. Everything that I have is a gift from him. And when I, when I live in a life of discontentment, what I'm saying is, God, what you've already given me isn't enough. God, what you've already done for me isn't enough. When in reality, if God never gave you another thing, and if he never did another thing for you, the fact that he decided and chose to hang on a cross, to give up his life so that you could find yours, that would have been enough. If it would have ended right there, and that was the only thing that God had ever done for each and every one of us, we could live content lives knowing that what he's already given us is enough. And yet here we find ourselves saying, God, it's not enough. God, I want more. See, we have, to, we have to count our blessings. This week we were at Mama's Pizza, and I know like most of my stories start with we were at Mama's Pizza, but that's just where, like, that's just where life happens for the Weasel family. And so we're at Mama's Pizza, and, uh, and before we went, I told the boys, I, t- I told the kids, I said, if you want to play games, you have to bring your own money. This is the first time I've ever told them that. I said, Dad's not going to give you a dollar to play games at Mama's. You've got birthday money. You've got allowance money. If you want to play games in the arcade, you bring your own money. So Jace grabbed like $10, and Jewel grabbed a couple, and Isaiah grabbed some. And Carter's standing there. I said, Carter, are you going to get some money? He says, no, I'm going to save mine. I said, good job, son. You were listening to the message last week. Save before you spend. Taking notes. Well done. Well done. And, uh, and he says, no, I'm going to save my money. So I said, okay, that means you can't play any games. He said, I know, Dad. I said, okay. So we get to Mama's Pizza. And then when we get to Mama's Pizza, the three kids who brought money, they run into the arcade. And Carter's standing there with that look on his face. And his parents, you know the look that I'm talking about, right? He has that look on his face. I said, son, what's wrong? Oh, I don't get to play any games. Yeah, that, we had that conversation. So remember, I, I told you to bring money, and you said you didn't want to bring money. You wanted to save it. And I think, I think you made a great decision. I think you made the right decision, but you have to understand that when you choose something, that means you can't choose something else. So your decision to, to save your money means you can't play games today. But I want to play games. Then you should have brought money, and now you'll know for next time. And so he said, and some of you are like, man, John, just give him a dollar. I'm trying to teach my kids a lesson here, okay? And so, <laughs> and so he's, he, he's sad, and, and Jace comes up to him, and Jace gives him a dollar. I know. <laughs> great, great kid. Highlight real moment. So Jace gives him a dollar. Carter goes, and he plays. And he plays the claw game, which is a ripoff anyway, because you hardly win anything out of it, because the claw opens when it gets to the top, and it's just like, that's dumb. And so he doesn't win anything. He comes back, and now he's crying. I said, son, what's wrong? He said, well, I didn't win anything. And he gets his competitive. <laughs> he gets it from me. And, uh, and he says, well, I didn't win anything. I said, son, I said, you have to change, you have to change your focus. So you have to change your attitude. I said, you chose not to bring any money because you wanted to save it. Good decision. When we got here, you were upset. And you were upset to the point where your brother gave you one of his dollars so that you could go and play, and now you come back upset because you didn't win anything? I said, son, you shouldn't be upset that you didn't win anything. You should be filled with joy with the fact that you even got to play a game. That's right, parenting moment 101. Like every now and then, every now and then I come through as a dad, I'm like, man, that was good. I don't know where that came from, but I can do this dad thing. And, and I said, you need to change your, change your focus. See, when we count our blessings, what it's doing is it's changing our focus. See, when I'm in accumulate mode, I'm thinking of all the things that I don't have and all the things that I need to get. When I'm counting my blessings, my mind goes from what I don't have to what I do have. We need to sit down and think about and remember all the ways that God has already blessed us. You want to be content? Look at what God has already done for you, number one. Number two. 
We need to live generously. The second thing that we need to do, if we're going to live lives of contentment, is to, to live generously. In Acts chapter 20, they're, 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 talking, they're recounting the words of Jesus. And he says, look, Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How many of you guys have ever heard that? It's better to give than to receive. And as a kid, it was like, no, it's not. And even, even as an adult, like this is, this is something that by, by, by nature, I'm not good at. Like, it, it's hard for me to get to, to get to this place. I'm not naturally bent that way. It takes Jesus in me and the Holy Spirit in me to, to get to that point. My wife is the opposite. If my wife gets blessed, her first thought is, how can I use this to bless other people? Incredible. She, she's an incredible, an incredible woman. She's incredibly generous and gifts are her love language. And so she's just all about, I'm going to do this for this person. I'm going to give this to this person. And she's just always in this attitude and this mindset of, of pouring out to everybody else. And me, I'm like, slow down. <laughs> like, calm down. For me, I'm not that way. But, but Jesus says, and the scripture says, it's better to give than it is to receive. Why? Because again, when we live lives of generosity, it changes our focus off of what we don't have and what we need to get to what we do have and what we can give. Rather than asking ourselves, what can I get? We need to begin to ask ourselves, what do I have to give? What do I not have, but what do I do have? There was a, a study done and they, they surveyed 30,000 American households. They studied 30,000 American households and, and they asked them different questions. And, and one of the questions that they asked them was, do you give to a local charity, whether it's a church or, or a nonprofit, do you give to charity? And, and what they found was the ones who gave to charities were 43% more likely to respond with they were very happy than those who didn't give to charity. I'm not saying that if you give to charity that that's automatically going to, to make you content. I'm not saying that if you give to charity that you're automatically going to be very happy in your life. I think rather what it, what it speaks to is the correlation between generosity and contentment. What it speaks to is when our focus is off of ourselves and we put it onto other people, then we begin to see all the things that we do have and all the ways that we can be a blessing to those around us. And as we are a blessing to those around us, we're, we're happier with where we are ourselves. It's no longer what do I not have, but it's now what can I give. So, so we have to understand we, we need to live lives of generosity. See, as Christians, our, our objective, our goal is to look more like Jesus, is it not? My goal every day is to look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday. And my goal tomorrow will be to look more like Jesus tomorrow than I do today. And there are days where I knock it out of the park, and there are days where I fall flat on my face. But every day I wake up, Jesus, help me to look more like you today. And if that's, if that's your prayer, if that's your heart's desire, is to look more like Jesus, you need to understand that you never look more like Jesus than you do when you're living generously. You'll never look more like Jesus than you will when you're giving, when you're helping others. Why? Because Jesus, everything he did was based in generosity. He was generous to the point of choosing to go to the cross and hang there for you and for me. By, by taking on sin, he who knew no sin became sin. Our sin was placed on him. Why? So that we could be made right in God's eyes. It was generosity. It was generosity that... In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave. What is that? It's generosity. God, your, your heavenly father is generous. Jesus was generous. When we live lives of generosity, we look like our heavenly father. So we need to, to be generous. And then the third thing is this. I want you to write this down. We have to want the right things. We have to ask ourselves, am I wanting the right things? It's not wrong to want things. We just have to make sure that we want the right thing. See, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 4, and this is the way he says. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. Now, now let me just, he, he's writing to them, and he's saying, look, you guys have had concern for me, and I appreciate your concern for me. I know you weren't able to meet my needs. See, what had happened was Paul was in a spot, and the church, they, they gathered some resources, and they sent it out to him. Well, the guy who was delivering it, he got sick, or, or something happened. He wasn't able to make it. 
Okay, so Paul's writing them. He's like, look, I know you wanted to help me. You weren't able to help me, but, but that's not the reason I'm writing this. He's like, I'm not throwing myself a pity party here. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. There's that word again. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. He continues, and he says, I've, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now understand, Paul is not writing this from some ivory tower, okay? He's writing this from prison. He's not writing this without experiences to back up what he's saying, but this man has been shipwrecked. He's been stranded on a desert island. He's been in prison more times than I can count. He's been whipped. He's been beaten. He's lived with nothing. And so when he writes and he says, look, I've learned the secret of how to be content, whether my stomach is full or empty. And that's the other thing. A lot of times we like to people that have a lot and we like to tell them you need to be content. But some of the most discontent people are the ones whose stomachs are empty. Some of the most discontent people are the ones who don't have that are looking at those that do saying, I want that. I want that. Listen. It doesn't matter where you're at. It's not a money issue. It's a heart issue. And so Paul's writing and he says, I know what it's like to be on both sides of the spectrum. And I've learned the secret of how to be content. How many of you guys want to know the secret? Okay, three of you. The rest of you could care less. How many of you guys want to know the secret? Okay, $5 you can buy the book outside. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the secret. He says, I know the secret. And I'm about to drop it on you. Here's the secret, verse 13. I can do all of this through Christ who gives me strength. Now this verse is a verse that a lot of times gets taken out of context. Because we see it under athletes' eyes and we, we see it in posts and, and people are always like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Right, and Vince Mancuso's at the gym stacking weights on. He's like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Like, that's not what this scripture, that's not what the scripture means. Okay, it's not, it's not, I'm going into this, this physical activity and I need strength and, and I can do everything. The Dodgers can, can quote this scripture all they want. God's not going to help them against the Red Sox. But what he's saying, what he's saying is this. He's saying, I've had plenty and I've had nothing. My stomach's been full and my stomach's been empty. I've had the best and I've had the the worst. I've lived on both sides and I know how to be content. I've found the secret of contentment. And the contentment is this, is that I can do it all through him who gives me strength. What's he saying? what, What he's really saying is this. He's saying the reason why I can be satisfied with what I have regardless of what I have It's because I already have everything that I want, and everything that I want is him. He says, I don't want anything else. I could have have a lot. Okay, I don't want anything else. I could have nothing. Okay, I don't want anything else. Why? Because I already have everything that I want, and everything that I want is him. It's him inside of me that allows me to be content, regardless of what may come my way. See, we could be over here wanting and wanting and wanting and accumulating and acquiring and trying to get as much as we can only to still have want in our lives. Or we could come over here and say, God, all I want is you. And as the cry of our heart turns from I want stuff and I want things and I want the house and I want the car and I want the job and I want the promotion and I want this and I want that. And and as our mindset and as our heart changes from I want that to Jesus, I simply want you then you'll realize everything that you ever needed was in him. And if he's everything that you need and everything that you want, then you will have no want and you can be satisfied regardless of where you are. Matt, you can come back. This morning, I think a lot of us know what we want. How many guys know what you want? Like there are things that I want. My Christmas list is pretty extensive this year. So I think the thing is we, we know what we want, but we don't know what to want. We want things, but are we wanting the right things? And Paul says, look, I've found the secret to contentment. The secret, content, the secret to contentment is found in wanting the right things. 
what would happen in your life? How would, how would your life look different if you wanted more of him as much as you wanted that new house? What would happen in your marriage if you wanted more of him as much as you wanted that promotion at work? What would happen in your home? What would happen in your family if you wanted more of him than you wanted that extra hour of sleep? Our world would be changed. Our lives would be transformed. The way that we, we see things and the way that we view people and the way that we, we view him and, and the way that we live our lives would be completely radically transformed and changed if rather than saying, I want stuff, I want things, I want this, I want that, and we learn to be content, we learn to be satisfied regardless of where we were simply by saying, God, all I want is you. And as we come over here and say, God, all I want is you, he promises to take care of each and every need. He promises to take care of us, to make sure that our needs are met. The problem is we confuse needs and wants. Say, God, meet my wants. God says, no, I'll meet your needs as we want more of him he fills blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled what are you wanting today are you wanting things or are you wanting more of him the secret to contentment is found in wanting the right things god may we want the right things amen stand with me this morning let's pray lord we thank you for your word god it's it's always challenging it's always that mirror that we, we check our reflection against. It's, it's the standard, it's the ruler, it's the unit of measurement that we compare ourselves against. And God, I'm not to compare myself to, to others, but I compare myself to your word. Am I living the life that you've called me to live? God, forgive me for those times that I have been discontent, that I've not been satisfied with what I have. Lord, this week as we go, may we remember to count our blessings. Rather than looking at what we don't have, look at all of the, the ways that you have already blessed us so richly and so abundantly. God, help us to live lives of generosity because you modeled it, you showed it, and, and we never look more like you than we do when, we are, when we're generous. God, help us to want the right things. Even as Paul said, I can do all of this because it's Christ in me. It's not, it's not me, but I can be content because I have everything I want and everything that I want is him. God, as we go from this place, I pray that you would show us if we are, are wanting any of the, the wrong things. If we want things more than we want you, God, may we reprioritize and reorder our lives. This morning, if you're here, and you've never given your heart to the Lord, but today you say, I want to, to live that life of contentment. I want to be happy. I want to be satisfied with where I am and with what I have. I don't want to continue to participate in, in the race and trying to get and trying to get. But today, if, if you want to give your heart to the Lord, you want to find your contentment in him, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. And if that's you with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around. If that's you and you want to give your heart to the Lord today, would you just do me a favor? Just, just raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you forward or anything. Thank you so much. Thank you all over the place. Thank you. Keep them up for just a second. Keep them up just a second. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. You can put your hands down this morning. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to repeat a simple prayer and just ask that you would repeat it after me in church. Would you help us out today? Just say, Jesus, thank you so much for your generosity that you gave up your life so that I can find mine. And today, I accept you into my heart. Come into my life. Change me from the inside out. Wash me and make me brand new. I confess I've made mistakes and I need a savior. Thank you that you are that savior. Lead me and guide me every day from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And let me pray for you today. Lord, I thank you for those that raised their hands and, and those that prayed that prayer from their heart. And God, your word says that there are angels rejoicing in heaven right now because of the decision that made. And God, today we rejoice with them. 
And we're thankful and we're grateful for your generosity. And Lord, as we go this week, help us to be salt. Help us to be light. Help us to recognize the opportunities that you're giving us to share your hope and your love with those around us. God, thank you for all the blessings that you've already given. Forgive us for living lives of discontentment. God, looking at what you've done, saying it's not enough. But Lord, we recognize that everything that we have, everything that we need, everything that we want is found in you. Lord, be with us this week. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 God bless you this morning. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or if you have need and you want us to agree with you, our prayer team is down here. We would love to pray with you and for you and agree with you in that. If not, God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.